One of the first things you learn in a calculus class covering infinite series is that the sum from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared converges. It's the prime example of a p-series, which we know converge when p is bigger than 1. This video is about something you don't usually learn in a calculus class. Namely, if that series converges, what does it converge to? This sum equals some finite number, and we want to determine what that number is. This is the Basel problem. This question was first posed in 1650, and it remained unsolved for almost 100 years. Because of that, it's one of the most famous problems in the history of math. The person who solved it first was named Euler. You may have heard of him. But instead of showing you how Euler solved the problem, I'm going to present a solution that actually wasn't discovered until 1993 over 300 years since the question was asked. It involves turning the infinite sum into a double integral and then using an insanely clever change of variables. It's fascinating that this is such a modern solution because it's completely elementary. I'll put a link to the original paper in the description below if you're curious. Before we get started, I just want to outline the solution so you know what to expect. First, we'll actually manipulate the original infinite sum into a new one. Next, we'll transform that sum into a double integral. And then finally, we'll use perhaps the most clever variable change of all time to finish it off. The first thing I'm going to do is decompose this sum into two groups. One group will be all of the terms with even index, and the other group will be all of the terms with odd index. The values of n that we range over are 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So when I group all of the even indices, I'll consider 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. All of those numbers are of the form 2k. Likewise, the odd indices are 1, 3, 5, and so on. They're all of the form 2k plus 1. Now the first even index we have is 2, so in this first sum I want to start k at 1. The first odd index we have is 1, so since I wrote 2k plus 1, I want to start my indices here at k equals 0. Now the next thing I'll observe is that k is just a dummy variable. And now that I've decomposed this sum, I can rewrite it using n instead. The reason I want to do that is because eventually I'm going to relate something in this new decomposition to the original sum that we started with. Notice that in this term, we have a 2 squared in the denominator. That's a factor of 4 that I can just pull out. And then notice that when I do that, we get 1 fourth times the sum from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. That's the original sum that we care about. So this decomposition turns into an algebraic equation involving s. s equals 1 fourth times s plus this new second sum over odd indices that we generated. We can solve for s by subtracting 1 fourth s from both sides to get 3 fourths s equals the new sum, multiply by 4 thirds, and there we go. Our original sum s that we care about is 4 thirds times the sum from 0 to infinity of 1 over 2n plus 1 quantity squared. The next step relies on the following very clever observation. Consider the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the 2n. This is a power rule problem. So to get the antiderivative, increase the power by 1 and divide by the new denominator. And then when we evaluate at x equals 1 and x equals 0, well, the 0 term goes away and I'm left with 1 to the 2n plus 1, which is 1, divided by 2n plus 1. Ah, so I can rewrite 1 over 2n plus 1 as an integral. And in the sum and here, we have two different copies of 1 over 2n plus 1. So here's what we can do. Start off with this sum, which is 4 thirds times the sum of the product of 1 over 2n plus 1 with itself. 
Using the equality in the blue thought bubble, that first 1 over 2n plus 1, I can rewrite as the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the 2n dx. And then I want to do the same thing with the second 1 over 2n plus 1, but instead of using x, I'm going to use the variable y. Why would I use y? Because I can. My goal here is to turn this into a double integral, so I'm formally introducing a new variable. Having done that, we have two decoupled single variable integrals with different variables. And by, for example, separation of variables, we can squish these together into one double integral. Now the next thing I'll do is I'll pull both of these integral signs through the summit. Integration is additive, so all I'm saying here is that the sum of all of these integrals, well, that's just the integral of the sum. Now because this is a calculus video, I won't spend too much time talking about the analytic justification here, but if you have enough background and you're wondering why this is justified, we could, for example, use monotone convergence. So I pull the integral signs through, and then I'll also do some algebra with the sumand by pulling out that common power of n to get quantity x squared y squared, all of that to the nth. Next I'll remind you about another infinite series fact, which is what we know about geometric series. A geometric series is anything that looks like the sum from, for example, 0 to infinity of some ratio to the n. And the main thing that we know about geometric series is that they converge when the ratio is less than 1 in absolute value, and we can say what they converge to. So for example, this geometric series that I wrote converges to 1 over 1 minus r. Well look what we have here. This is a geometric series. The ratio is x squared times y squared. And because I'm integrating over 0 to 1 cross 0 to 1, x and y are both between 0 and 1, so their product, and then the square of their product, is also between 0 and 1. So that ratio is always smaller than 1 in absolute value, which means that infinite series converges. And by this geometric series formula, it converges to 1 over 1 minus x squared y squared. And with that, we've successfully turned this original sum that we care about into a double integral. I find this step alone really cool. We're finally in the territory of multivariable calculus, and we have a simple looking double integral to evaluate. Now I've mentioned a couple times already that we'll do a pretty clever variable change, but it's worth thinking about other options. For example, with respect to x, we could factor this as partial fractions. You could use some kind of inverse hyperbolic trig functions. You could try a number of things, and I encourage you to give it a shot. For this particular solution, we will make a multivariable change of variables. So in other words, I'm going to come up with a new coordinate system with variables u and v, and we'll completely translate this integral to be a uv integral. So we need to call x something, and we need to call y something. And if you want, you can pause the video to see if you can come up with the substitution. But I'll tell you now that it does come from left field. It's unlike anything you've probably seen before. So what is it? We're going to call x sine of u over cosine of v, and y sine of v over cosine of u. This is wild, and you'll see in a second how effective this is. But just to be clear, what this represents is a map from the uv world to the xy world. The region we're integrating over in the xy world is a unit square, and one of the difficult things that we'll have to figure out with this substitution is what the corresponding region in the uv world is. But I'm actually going to save that step for last. Next, let me remind you how to change variables in a double integral like this. When we start out with an integral in the xy world, to change it, we have to change the bounds, we have to change the actual function that we're integrating, and we have to change the differentials. And when you change the differentials in an integral like this, this means multiplying by the absolute value of the Jacobian of g. So let's compute that first. The Jacobian is going to be the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix of first partial derivatives. The derivative of x with respect to u is easy. 
And likewise, the derivative of y with respect to v is easy. The off-diagonal positions are a little less easy, but still straightforward. We want to think about, for example, the x component as being cosine of v to the negative 1. The power rule then gives me negative cosine to the negative 2. And then by the chain rule, I'll multiply by negative sine of v. Those negative signs join together to become a positive. The lower left corner, the derivative of y with respect to u, is similar. Next, when we take the determinant, look at what happens with the first term. The top left corner times the bottom right corner is actually 1. All of these cosines cancel each other out. Then we'll subtract the product of the off diagonals. And I'll do some algebra in one step. Notice that we have a sine of u in both terms and then a cosine squared of u in the denominator. So in the product, we have sine squared of u over cosine squared of u, which is just tangent squared of u. And likewise, we get a sine squared of v over cosine squared of v, which is tangent squared of v. So there's our Jacobian. Now, again, we still don't know what e is, but let's change everything else first. This double integral that we're starting with is going to be 4 thirds times the double integral of whatever e is times 1 over 1 minus. Now I'll do some more algebra in one step, but when I take x squared times y squared, we'll get a sine squared of u over cosine squared of u, which is tangent squared of u. And then likewise, we get sine squared of v over cosine squared of v. That's tangent squared of v. So the transformed denominator is exactly the same as the Jacobian we calculated earlier. When we multiply them together, they cancel out, leaving us with a double integral of 1. How nice is that? Now, remember that when you compute the double integral of 1 over some region, what does that give you? It gives you the area of the region. So it tells us that the number that we're after is 4 thirds times the area of whatever this region E is. Recall that we have this map going from the UV world to the XY world. We know that the region in the XY world is the unit square, and we need to figure out the corresponding region to the left. A good way to approach these things is to write down the inequalities that describe the region on the right, which in this case is x between 0 and 1 and y between 0 and 1, and then use our substitution to come up with inequalities involving u and v, and then we'll see if we can unravel what that means. So the region we care about is described by sine of u over cosine of v being between 0 and 1, and likewise sine of v over cosine of u being between 0 and 1. Let's multiply through by the cosines in both inequalities. Look at the left-hand side of each inequality first. This tells us that sine of u and sine of v have to be non-negative. Now, if you think about the unit circle, this will tell you that u and v have to both be non-negative. On the standard interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, sine is positive from 0 to pi over 2. So this cuts out the region a little bit. The trickier part is the upper inequalities. The key here is that the boundary of this region is going to be described when we have equality. So when sine of u equals cosine of v, and likewise sine of v equals cosine of u. This part's a little trickier. It's a little more subtle than saying something like, oh, well, u and v are both pi over 4. Those are examples of points where sine and cosine coincide. But for example, if u is pi over 3, and v is pi over 6, sine of u and cosine of v are the same. The important general fact is that sine and cosine are horizontal shifts of each other. Here's a graph of sine. Here's a graph of cosine. Just scoot one of them over to get the other. In other words, here's the algebraic relation. Sine of pi over 2 minus theta, this is cosine and cosine of pi over 2 minus theta is sine. This is one of the first trig identities you ever learn about. Now look at the equalities we're trying to achieve. 
If I want, for example, sine of u to be cosine of v, by this trig identity, what that tells me is that I want v to be pi over 2 minus u. Likewise, if I want sine of v to be cosine of u, I want u to be pi over 2 minus v. Now, v equals pi over 2 minus u, and u equals pi over 2 minus v. Those are the same exact equation. So the boundary of this region E is further defined by v equals pi over 2 minus u. And if I sketch that on my picture here, we get a line with negative slope, which caps off this region as a triangle. The u and v intercepts of this red line are both at pi over 2. So here we go, E is a triangle. It's got a base of length pi over two and a height of pi over two. The sum that we're interested in is four thirds times the area of E. E is a triangle, how do you compute the area? One half base times height, so we take four thirds times one half times the base is pi over two, the height is pi over two. Do some simplification, we get pi squared on top. Two of the twos kill off the four in the numerator, and we're left with six in the denominator. And look at that. We just solved the Basel problem with a double integral. The last 300 years have produced many different solutions to the Basel problem. There are solutions using Maclaurin series. There are solutions using Fourier series. There are solutions that use complex analysis and all of them are interesting in their own right. But this one is my favorite, mostly because of how amazing I find this variable substitution. Together with the fact that we don't use any fancy math, this is just a calculus solution. It's a calculus solution to a calculus problem, but one that remained undiscovered for 300 years.